are now tuned in to the Nancy Ruffin Show. Welcome back to another episode of the Nancy Ruffin Show. I am your host, Nancy Ruffin, aka The Purpose Pusher. I am an award-winning writer, poet, and speaker who is passionate about three things. God, goals, and growth. And if you are new here, welcome. It is an honor to have you join us. And if you aren't already subscribed, make sure you subscribe so that you can stay updated every time we drop a new episode. Um, If you are not familiar with the work that I do, I help women to step up, show up, And most importantly, take control of their lives. And I do this in a number of ways. One of the ways is through this podcast. Uh, I also wrote and published uh, my award-winning personal development book back in 2017, Live on Purpose. And purpose is something that I am really passionate about. I am really committed to helping women just tap into their potential, rediscover who they are, and just step up into who they are supposed to be so that they are using their God-given gifts, their skills, their acquired talents, and experiences to create the life that they want. And for the past 10 years, I have worked with and mentored women, helping them to let go of their limiting beliefs and increase their self-awareness. Because much of what keeps us stuck in life is our belief system and what we have internalized ourselves to believe about our lives, to believe about our abilities. And we don't even realize how so many of these beliefs we've been carrying for all of our lives since childhood. Um, And so this is something that I'm really passionate about because I believe that if you can change your thoughts if you can change your belief system, if you can change what you believe about yourself and start to um, turn those negative limiting beliefs into positive and empowering beliefs, you can absolutely transform your life. But it all starts with you. And so in this podcast, this is what I really challenge you to think about every single week and whether it's through my own personal anecdotes, through the stories that I share, through Bible scriptures or Bible stories. All of it is designed um, to help you reconnect with your source, identify who God has created you to be, and then give yourself permission to step fully into that because you are not created to live a mediocre life. You were not created to believe that you're never going to amount to much, that you're not enough, that you're not capable, that you don't have what it takes to succeed. Like you were not created with those beliefs. Those are beliefs that you somehow um, learned. Someone, um, imparted their own limiting beliefs onto you and you somehow internalize that as your truth. And the truth is that it's not. You are not what others say that you are. You are not other people's limitations. And so we have to start shifting how we show up in the world, how we show up for ourselves and what we think about ourselves. So again, if you're new here, welcome. That is just a little bit of um, what we, you know, discuss here. I hope that you have had an incredible summer so far. I, for one, cannot believe that summer is almost over. In a few short weeks, the kids will be heading back to school here in the New York Tri-State area uh, because I'm based in New Jersey. Um, And so school is starting, I believe, September 8th for the kids. And this year... um, Even though we're still, you know, in the midst of the COVID pandemic, even though we're starting to see an increase in the numbers across the nation, um, the kids are going back into the school building. There is no more virtual um, learning. 
I myself have to get back into the office full time as well in September. So there's a lot that is going to be happening with the next within the next few weeks in my household. But before then, I just want to recap a little bit about my past this past weekend. Um, last week, my husband and I celebrated 20 years of wedded bliss. We have been married for 20 years. Um, and that is insane to me because I still feel um, very much in love with my husband. I mean, by no means has the journey been easy. It has been, it's been really hard at times. Um, our love has been tested. Our commitment has been tested. Um, but it's weird because it's even though it feels like the years went by, like I know that there were some really long years where it felt like it, they were never going to end, right? Because when we find ourselves um, in the midst of our storms, uh, like those storms can feel like they last a lifetime. And so this past weekend, uh, we celebrated that huge milestone with our closest friends and family. You know, and it was important for us um, to keep it small and intimate um, because we wanted to share the moment with the individuals who have been most pivotal to our relationship, right? The the people who have surrounded us these past 20 years and have supported us, have encouraged us, have guided us in our marriage walk um, because it's not easy. You know, when you get married, um, after the wedding, like that's when like the real work begins, you know, the wedding is a huge celebration and it's a night of fun. Um, but what you don't recognize at the moment is how much work it really takes to make a successful marriage. It is a conscious choice that both individuals make every single day to show up for each other. Because when you get married, it no longer is about you. It really becomes um, about the partnership and what God has brought together through the two of you. Um, and I will tell you that if we did not have God in the middle of our marriage, we definitely would not have survived this long and it's easy it's so easy to give up when times get hard and when the obstacles show up and when the storms you know come in to wreak havoc in your life like you don't want to deal with that right so it's no wonder why so many people end up getting divorced because deciding to stay and work through that it's hard is painful. It's a struggle. It requires you to um, compromise. It requires you to forgive. Like all of these things that make us really uncomfortable, um, we have to be willing to do once we get married. It's about taking yourself out of it and really um, just remembering the the vow and the commitment that you both made to God and to each other. And because we are selfish people, because humans are selfish, it's so easy for us to just consider how we're feeling in the moment and not think about the promise that we made. And so for those of you who are considering marriage, um, make sure that you really think about what you're saying yes to. Because what you're saying, it's easy to say yes in the moments of joy and happiness and you feel in love and you feel those butterflies in your stomach. Yeah, you, you when you think about that, it's easy for you to think, yeah, I can spend the rest of my life with this person. But I would invite you that instead of thinking about that, think about the absolute worst thing that your partner could do. Think about what would be the most painful thing that you could experience in your marriage. And then think about whether or not you can get past that, if you can stick it through, if you are willing to get into the fire, right, when things get hot and stay there 
um, you know, and ride it through with your partner. Now, if you can say yes to that, if you can say yes, to, that, you're, that you can deal with the absolute worst thing that can happen in your marriage, then, then you're ready for marriage. But if you can't, then you might have to reconsider because marriage should not be something that you say yes to. And then in the back of your mind, you tell yourself, well, if it doesn't work out, we can just get a divorce. Like divorce should never be an option. Because what happens so many times is that when um, couples are tested, when marriages are tested, um, we many um, seek whatever that whatever they're missing in their marriage, they seek it outside of their marriage. And it's easy to fall into temptation. It's easy to believe that the grass is greener on the other side. But I will tell you that all relationships require work. All relationships in the beginning are great. In all relationships in the beginning, you feel the butterflies, you feel the excitement, right? Because you're still in the getting to know each other phase. So all of it is new and all of it is exciting and you always feel happy and you always feel joyful. But let me tell you that the long lasting relationships, that is, you're not going to always feel happy. You're not going to always feel joyful. You may not even always like your partner. They're going to get on your nerves. They're going to annoy you. But you know what? That's a part of life. And you have to think of your partner as your family member. You know, the same way that you, um, you know, your parents might annoy you or get on your nerves or a sibling, right? Um, and it happens because we're all individuals and we're never going to get along 100% of the time. But you don't divorce, at least many, most of us don't divorce our parents. We don't divorce our siblings, right? We figure out how to work it out because we love each other. And so the same is true with your spouse. Once you get married and once you make that commitment, you are joined for life, at least in the eyes of God. And it shouldn't be so easy to walk away just because things get hard, you know. And so for my husband and I, Lord knows that we have had some really difficult moments in our marriage during these past 20 years. We have, you know, survived health issues. We have um, just survived growing pains, you know, the, 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 the discomfort of growing into adults. When we met, um, I was 19, 20 years old. I was still living at home with my parents. I was incredibly spoiled. Um, he was spoiled because he was an only child and coming together and having to compromise and give up some of our independence because at, we had to start to think as a unit, as a partnership um, is really, it's really hard. And those growing pains are really hard. And we really grew up together. But I'm grateful that we did because so many, you know, couples grow up and then they tend to grow apart. But we were committed to one another. We were committed um, to God. Um, and whenever things got really hard between us, like we always um, went back to our source. You know, we went to counseling multiple times. We tried different types of of counseling. We went to see, you know, a, a traditional um, psychotherapist. We went to counseling through the church. Um, we got counseled, you know, through family members, you know, who have been married for a long amount of time. Like we tried everything um, to make our marriage work. And because we did that, because we never gave up on each other, we have now created um, the marriage that works for us. And that's important for you to remember in your own relationship. Don't try to model your relationship after someone else, right? And for what works for somebody else, because every marriage is different. Every marriage has two different individuals and what works for one couple may not necessarily work for the other. So just remember that there's no perfect model or blueprint for what a marriage should be. You have to figure out what the perfect marriage for you is going to be and then work on cultivating that. Um, so with that being said, on this week's episode, I really want to talk about how we take some of the trials 
that we experience in life and, and how um, we turn those into triumphs, right? And how sometimes the very hardships that we go through are the things that God is using to build us up, to make us stronger so that we can come out on the other side better than we were before. And that has been true in my marriage. That has been true in my own personal life, you know, and I know that it is true for you in whatever season you currently find yourself in. So we're going to take a little break. And when we come back, we're going to get into this conversation about the trial is necessary for the triumph. Ever since I started using Anchor to record my podcast, the entire process has been seamless. Anchor has everything that I need to record and edit my podcast directly from my phone or my computer. Additionally, Anchor goes one step further and distributes my podcast for me without me having to do anything so that it can be heard on Spotify, Apple iTunes, iHeartRadio, and the many other streaming platforms that are out there. And the best part about the entire thing is that every single time someone listens to my podcast, cha-ching, I make money. Yes, honey, I get to monetize my podcast with no minimum listenership or no minimum downloads. So if you've been considering starting your own podcast, everything you need to make a podcast is on Anchor. So make sure you head on over, download the free Anchor app, or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hello, my name is Avery. You are listening to The Nancy Raffin Show. Make sure to subscribe and leave a comment if you're new. Hope you enjoy the show. Welcome back. Thank you for sticking around. And as promised, today we are talking about how sometimes the trials that we go through in life are necessary for the triumphs that we end up experiencing. And the reason why I wanted to discuss this is because so often times when we find ourselves in the middle of our hard seasons, it's really difficult for us to imagine that there's going to be a bright side. It's really hard for us to imagine that there is going to be something better on the other side. And recently, I have been reading the book of Genesis. One of the things that I've been really intentional about this past year is digging into the Bible into not just reading it, but really studying the scriptures, understanding the stories, being able to tie the stories of the Bibles back to my own personal life and to God's promises for all of us. And so I want to talk specifically about the story of Joseph in the Bible. And his story starts um, at Genesis 37. And if you're not familiar with who Joseph is, I will give you a brief synopsis of um, his lineage. So when we first start Genesis... Um, you know, we see the the first man that we see right after Adam, you know, is um, Abraham. Well, the first prominent man that we see after Adam is Abraham. And Abraham, um, as you know, was named Abraham because God had said he was going to be the father of all nations, right? So all of humanity was going to stem from Abraham. And so Abraham then had a son named Isaac. Isaac then had a son named Jacob. And then Jacob had a son named Joseph. And Jacob had 12 sons. Joseph was one of his 12 sons. Um, Jacob was renamed Israel by God. Um, So his 12 sons became known as the 12 tribes of Israel, aka the 12 sons of Jacob. And so what I really love about Joseph's story is that um, he was Jacob's favorite son, right? He was the youngest, but he was the one that was most loved by Jacob. And because he was the favorite, this made um, 
Jacob's other sons jealous. That jealousy really motivated them to want to get rid of their brother, right? Um, so in Genesis 37, um, we see that Joseph um, was a dream interpreter. This is one of his God-given gifts. He is able to prophesy. He is able to interpret dreams. Um, and he was given this gift of prophecy. Um, and during one of the interactions, like with his brothers, he tells his brothers about his dreams of becoming a king and that they would have to bow to him. And like, you know, that just really um, pushed them over the ledge. Like they were, if they weren't already jealous of Joseph, this made them even more jealous. And because they were jealous of him, they plotted to kill him. But instead of killing him, they decided that they were going to sell Joseph to the Ish. Ish forgive me, if I mispronounced this. Ishmael, Ishmaelites, um, and so they sell their brother, and then they tell their father Jacob that Joseph had been attacked by a ferocious animal. And what really stuck out to me in this particular chapter um, is that it captures well the lengths that humans will go through because of jealousy, right? When when we envy someone or when we're jealous of somebody else um, and you let that jealousy that like, corrode your heart, there are no lengths that, you know, the human won't go through um, to try to attain what this other person has. But as you continue to read through the book of Genesis all the way like towards the end, you continue to see um, how Joseph meets with different types of trials in his life, right? So first he sold to the Ishmaelites from, by his brothers. From that, he is then sold um, to Potiphar, who is the captain um, in Pharaoh's, he's a captain in, in Pharaoh's army, right? So um, he is sold to the Egyptians. But because Joseph is blessed by God, he quickly becomes favored by Potiphar, right? And under Joseph's care, everything in the household, in his household was blessed. So even though Joseph is a slave in Europe, Joseph thrives under God's blessing. In spite of being in the top position in his master's household, Potiphar, well, Potiphar's wife, falsely accuses Joseph of rape, right? Because now here you have Joseph, um, he's strong, he's young, um, he's handsome. And so Potiphar's wife wants to sleep with him. And her and her little trifling behind, you know, like puts a, comes on to Joseph, right? So she's trying to sleep with him. But because Joseph is a righteous man, Joseph ain't trying to go there. That's his, you know, master's wife. Like he's not trying to sleep with her. So he like rebukes her advances. And because he does this, she then goes back and tells her husband that Joseph tried to rape her, right? So of course, um, now Joseph gets thrown in jail. Like now he's imprisoned, but even in jail, he still has God's blessing. He is still favored. So even in jail, he becomes like one of the favorite prisoners. And so the head guard in jail makes Joseph um, like the head of the area where he is being held. Um, and then in in that process, he, um, again, because he has this gift of prophecy and he has this ability um, to interpret dreams, he is able to interpret the dreams of two of the other prisoners. And both of those dreams come true. And one of the people that are jailed with him used to be a guard in Pharaoh's army. Right. And Joseph tells them, Joseph tells one of them, you are going to like meet your your death. Like you're going to die. 
Um, and then the other one, he says, you are going to be restored to the prior position that you had in Pharaoh's army, right? And this all comes to pass. One of them dies, and then this guard that had been in prison ends up getting his position restored in Pharaoh's army. Okay, fast forward. Years later, Joseph is still in jail. However, um, Pharaoh then has a dream, right? That he just does not understand what the dream is. He's trying to figure it out. Um, and he communicates this to one of the, you know, his men, that's one of his guardsmen. This is the guardsman that was in prison with Joseph. Um, and he tells Pharaoh, he's like, well, I remember when I was in jail, there was this man in there who was able to interpret dreams. He interpreted, you know, my dream and the dream of another prisoner. And they both, those dreams both came true. So because of that, Joseph is now released from prison. He sent to Pharaoh's home to interpret Pharaoh's dreams, right? So he tells Pharaoh that the meaning of his dream is basically that Egypt is going to enjoy seven years of abundance, seven years of wealth, but then it's going to be followed by seven years of famine and that he had to like prepare, um, you know, for the famine that was coming to pass that he had to store up all their food, all of their grain, like really prepare Egypt to be able to withstand um, the famine that was coming. And so because of this and because of his ability to foresee the future and interpret the dream, Pharaoh makes Joseph, like he appoints him to be like the governor of Egypt. He puts him in charge of preparing Egypt for the famine and storing all the food and making sure that they have everything that they're going to need so that when this famine comes, the people of Egypt, you know, can survive. And so he puts Pharaoh in charge. Um, he puts Joseph in charge. Joseph becomes the second most important man in the land of of Egypt, right? But when we think about Joseph's story and how it started, when we think about his brothers taking him and selling him into slavery, then we see how Joseph was sent to jail and was imprisoned to now seeing that he has become the second most powerful man in Egypt all because he had God's blessing. And I'm sure that in the moment when he was being sold into slavery, in the moment that he was getting imprisoned and being jailed, um, what would what could have been going through his mind, right? Imagine if that was you. If you were sold into slavery, what would you be saying? You would be wondering, like, God, why me? Why is this happening to me? Why did my family betray me in this way? Like, why did they hate me so much that they would sell me into slavery? And then when he ends up in jail, like if it can't get any worse, right? So now not only was he a slave, now he has lost his freedom and has been imprisoned, right? But what we don't see is that all of that had to happen in order for him to be elevated into this governor, you know, position, to be elevated, to be the second most important man in Egypt. Because had he not been a slave, had he not been imprisoned, he never would have met the the pharaoh's guardsmen in jail to be in, to be able to interpret the dream to then also be able to interpret pharaoh's dream right if those things would have not happened he would not have had the outcome that he had and so often when we're experiencing our own trials when we find ourselves in our own prisons when we find ourselves slaves to our own circumstances we don't understand that those are the very things that God is using to prepare us to mold us to position us so that we can eventually claim our right position right as as kings and queens and as leaders of our own destinies it's so easy for us to find ourselves in the middle of the trial and stay there and dwell there and and, and have pity on ourselves when instead what we should be doing is thanking God for preparing us even though we may not know where God is taking us Romans 8, 28 tells us that God uses all things in our life 
for his good and for our good. This is why it's so important for us to stay faithful. This is why it's so important to have hope, to not lose faith in the promises of God. You know, and the story of Joseph for me is so powerful because it really exemplifies how God uses all things to work for our own good. He was sold into slavery. He was imprisoned. He was kept away from his family, from his father for years. But all of it was necessary in order for him to become the second most powerful man in Egypt. He was treated like royalty. Pharaoh gave him power over all of Egypt. And it was all because of the time that he spent in prison and his God-given gift to interpret dreams. How are you using your own God-given gifts to create the future that God has planned for you? We never know how the current trial in our life is the very thing that God will use to propel us into triumph in the future. Sometimes the trial is necessary for the triumph. So you can't dwell in in your current circumstance, right? You can't grieve or mourn for what you've lost, but instead what you need to start doing is, uh, is recognizing that sometimes God has to take certain things away in order for us, in order for him to bless us with the more that he has for us. We always think that what we have right now is the best, not realizing, not recognizing that God has something better in store for us. If only we become obedient, if only we step outside of our current situation and just trust God with every area of our lives. Listen. If I have learned anything throughout my own life, even in my own marriage, I can use um, specific examples of trials that my husband and I have endured that have ultimately led to greater, bigger triumphs, not only in our lives, but in our marriage. When we first got married, the first couple of years, my husband got diagnosed with cancer. He was 31 years old when he got diagnosed with stage two non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Okay, and now that diagnosis for a young person, for newlyweds, can be devastating, right? But we took that season of trials as an opportunity to just get things in our relationship in order, But my husband also used it as the opportunity to really refocus his priorities. He stopped living the reckless life that he had been living up until that point. During that time, he was going out all the time. He was drinking all the time. He wasn't eating the right foods. He wasn't being mindful of his health. He wasn't taking care of his body. But when he got that cancer diagnosis, All of that changed. His lifestyle changed. Our commitment to one another got stronger because at that time we were struggling in our relationship. We were struggling in our marriage. We didn't know how to be um, husband and wife to each other. We didn't know how to be partners. We were so used to being on our own, being individuals, being independent, that we did not know what it meant to be a married couple. And that cancer diagnosis changed everything around for us. So what ultimately started out as a trial ended up as us being triumphant, not just in our relationship, but in the way that we were caring for ourselves and we were caring for our health. When we were struggling with conceiving, all that did was increase my faith in God. It made me realize that there are so many things that are beyond my control, but the thing that I can control is how faithful I am to my God during those moments when I have nothing else. And this is true for you. I don't know what season you are currently in in your life. I don't know if you're mourning the loss the, the, the loss of a loved one, or maybe you didn't get 
that job that you wanted, or maybe you lost the job that you have, or maybe that relationship didn't work. Maybe that friendship ended, right? All of these things that happen to us throughout our lives are happening for us. They're not being sent to us to destroy us. They're happening to us to build us up, to increase our faith, to release it, to give it to God so that he can work in our lives. That's what trusting in God means. It means that you relinquish your own selfish desire to control the outcome. And instead you recognize that the one that is guiding you is in full control. And then when you give it to God, He will give you everything that you want and more. I remember right before I started in the role, in the job that I currently have, I was interviewing for two jobs. It was my current job and it was another job. And the promise of this other job, it it was more enticing, right? The, the, The position was more visible, the salary was more money. The responsibility was greater, right? And I kept on praying on it. And I kept on saying, you know, well, what are the pros and what are the cons um, between both of these jobs? And then what happened was I was I, I, I had to make a decision. Um, and then when I weighed the pros and the cons, I knew that this other job would demand more of me and my time and take me away from my family than I was willing to give. It was a position where I would be on call at and I had to work on the weekends, you know? And so for me, weekends are non-negotiable because the weekends are the time that I have with my girls, right? To do their extracurricular activities, to spend time with my husband, all of these things. So I decided to accept the other position with a little less salary. And the position was not as visible, but you know what happened? That other job ended up getting discontinued. I don't know what happened in that company, but that role got eliminated. And I recognized in that moment that God was protecting me from the loss of a job. And so sometimes when we see things that may be more enticing, that we believe um, we deserve more and we don't get those things, sometimes you know, the, the rejection is God's protection. It's him protecting us from something that we can't see down the line, but that he knows is coming. Sometimes that relationship that didn't work is necessary in order for you to grow into who you're supposed to become in order for you to find the true happiness that God has created for you. Because we all know that God has created our perfect partner. But if you're holding on to relationships that are unhealthy, that are toxic, that require you to compromise all the time and the other person isn't compromising, if you find that you're giving more than you're getting, if you find that uh, they're putting all of the responsibility on making the relationship work onto you and it's not a 50-50 partnership, sometimes you have to be okay with letting that relationship go because the longer you hold on to the things that are no good for you, the longer you prolong receiving the things that God has in store for you. You have to start recognizing that those trials that you're going through are leading the way to the victory. They're leading the way for you to be triumphant. God is going to turn that trial into triumph, that test into your testimony. But if we keep on holding to the past, we're never going to be able to reach for the future. So I hope that you take some time to, to, to find the grace within your current situation. Understand that everything that is happening to you is happening for you. It's for your benefit. It's for the benefit of God's kingdom. He is going to bless you with all of your heart's desires. You have to learn to surrender. You have to learn to let go. And when you feel like you are being forsaken, just remember the story of Joseph. Turn to Genesis 37, read Genesis 37 all the way to the end, to Genesis 50. Because in the last scripture, um, his brothers um, are afraid for themselves once their father dies, right? Because Jacob dies and now the the brothers are worried that Joseph is going to 
exact revenge on them for all of the bad things that they did to Joseph. But what Joseph tells them is that what you intended for evil, God intended for good. Okay, so when when his brothers were doing this these evil things to him, when they were being malicious in their intent, God was using those very same things to bless Joseph down the line. So I want you to apply that same story to yourself. Remember that everything that is happening to you is happening for your greater good. I hope that you were blessed by this week's message. If this resonated with you, please leave us a comment letting us know in what way it resonated with you and share with your community. You never know who is going to need this word and sharing is caring. So until next time, mi gente, go out there, live your best life, stay faithful, go out there and crush those goals. Thank you for listening to the Nancy Ruffin Show. I hope you enjoyed spending your time. Bye.